Hey, hey, Dr. Robin McKay here, and welcome to Mindset Rx. This is your place to be if you are an emotionally intelligent leader and you're ready to set the tone for a positive, productive, and purposeful life. We'll just encompass it that way. If you've been here with me for a while, you know I say week, month, year, life, legacy, all the things, and really it comes down to the people who are getting the most out of these podcasts are the ones who are really committed to creating more purpose, more meaning, and actually leaning into their highest potential, actualizing their most deeply held hopes and dreams, their heart's desires. So if that's you, I'm so glad you're here. It is Mental Health Awareness Month, this month of May, if you're listening as this comes out. And... So for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be talking about, once again, some mental health issues that continue to plague my colleagues, clients who are in the corporate space, especially those of you who are in tech, in healthcare, in fintech, and other high-performance fields, and especially women and people who belong to or are part of underrepresented groups in the corporate space. So... If that's you, I'm so glad you're here. If you're one of our allies, one of our champions, we're happy to have you here as well to say yes and open doors for those people who continue to fight the good fight and to lead and to create and contribute and to master what we came here to master. So all this to say, today we're talking about creative solutions to recovering from burnout and by the way, if you're here with me live on the LinkedIn live, say hello in the comments and be sure to just at least put your first name because unless you're logged into my platform, which is StreamYard, I won't be able to see your name. So do that. Or if you're listening to watching the recording, say hello, I'll circle back and say hi back to you. And um, let's go ahead and dive into today's content. I'm excited. I was thinking about this, con this conversation I was going to have with you all on my way to pick up Cooper, my golden doodle from doggy daycare. And I find I have a lot of good thoughts. A lot of my good thinking comes during car time. It could be because I grew up in South Dakota and I lived in Kansas for a long time. And there were just always long expanses of, of interstate that I would have to travel to get from one place to another. So I just did a lot of my best thinking in the car and I would get great downloads even when I was back in grad school. Um, actually, most of my life, I got really good downloads driving in the car and today was no exception. So I, if you've been around me for a while, you'll already know this. My clients call me the Velvet Hammer. And behind closed doors, when I'm just being real crystal clear, real honest, real observant about what's going on, I just say what I think because I learned a long time ago when I say what I think, it actually extends the conversation and it makes me even more effective at my work. And so I'm telling you this to tee up what I'm going to say next, which is on my way to pick up Cooper today, I had this idea that I wanted to talk about the dumb things that smart people do to try to recover from burnout. And, you know, the professional part of me, the you know, the polished part of me was like, oof, I don't know if you can say that and say that on LinkedIn, like dumb things smart people do. Really? Is that a cool thing to do or not? And it's really questioning that. But I decided to go with it. And here's why. I think that we're all just craving what's real. And quite frankly, it's my experience, both from working with leaders for the past 16 years on burnout recovery, recovering from burnout myself as a young professional before I started my PhD and having periods of milder forms of burnout since then as well, we all do some dumb things. And it's not that, it's not that we're not well-intended, but because smart people have been trained from the time we're little kids to over-rely on our intellect, we just think that our intellect, our brain is going to get us through this next thing, which in this case, we're talking about burnout. And so we do these dumb things and we know we shouldn't do the dumb things. And what I've also found is that smart people often have plenty of information. In fact, if you're not recovering from burnout, 
it's probably not due to lack of information. Certainly you can go Google how to recover from burnout. Certainly you can go to Amazon and download probably 17 books to Sunday about how to recover from burnout. So it's not a lack of information. It's not even sometimes a lack of earnestness because you use your hard work and your tenacity and your grit and your persistence to arrive at this place where you are today, as accomplished as you are, as, as, as the leader that you are. And yet I've got some good news and bad news. The good news is congratulations. The bad news is to recover from burnout. You can't use the same tools, the same mindsets, the same practices that got you into burnout in the first place. Like that's, that's kind of dumb. And I know we can all agree that that's kind of dumb. Now, I'm not saying you're dumb. I'm just saying that sometimes our brains create these scenarios where we're just in a, an if then do loop, if then do loop from programming, right? If then do, and we get in that gerbil wheel, we get in that set and we don't know what else to do except the things that we've always done in the past. Well, if those aren't working for you, that's what I'm talking about when, when I'm talking about dumb things. So let's, let me just run through these. I think there's like 12 of them. Actually, 11 of them are done, dumb. One of them is actually pretty heartbreaking. And if I could eradicate this from the planet, that would be my, that would be my wish. That would be my heart's desire. So let's talk about these dumb things that we do. And, you know, by the end of our time together today, of course, I'm going to be sharing some of the creative solutions that I have that actually work. They've worked for me. They've worked for my clients. And um, maybe they'll work for you as well. So let's have a look at these dumb things. First dumb thing that we do is that you know that in order to start feeling better if you're burned out, you should probably step away from the screen. So a dumb thing is I do this too. Even now I'll do this. I'll say, God, I need to get away from my screen. I need to step away from my screen. And I will immediately switch from my phone to my laptop or from my phone to my iPad. Like how is that switching anything? It's a momentary switch of attention from one device to another, but I'm still attached to a device. So while I know that unplugging from my devices is a good thing and contributes to me feeling better and perhaps recovering from burnout. That habit, oftentimes it's unconscious, of switching from device to device only serves to propagate more burnout, doesn't it? Okay. Number two, we say, oh, I'm so burned out. I need to take a vacation. Okay. So if you take nothing else away from our time together, I want you to take this. Vacations do not support burnout recovery in and of themselves, because here's why. I know you've probably done this. And if you haven't done this, you have somebody close to you who has done this, which is you take a vacation and then you spend most of the vacation thinking about work, calling into meetings, right? Checking your email, or if you're not doing that, if you've decided, nope, I'm completely offline, I'm not going to do those things, you're still thinking about and talking yourself out of checking your email, calling into meetings, seeing what's going on. It's dumb. I'm, we'll talk about what the solutions are, but I just want to call these out. And you can raise your hand. I've done that too. So just raise your hand. Smart people do dumb things a lot. It just happens. It just happens to be that way. Here's another one. I need to spend the day off. I need to take a day off. I need a break. I need to take some PTO or PPO or whatever you kids are calling it these days. And then you spend at least half the day worrying about that one project that might go sideways because you're not hot on its trail the whole time. And then, oh, and also probably you're also messaging your work friends to find out how that project is going. You miss your friends. You miss your work. You're so used to doing the thing that even on your days off, you really can't unplug. Number four, I'm sighing here because seriously, this is one that, that happens a lot and it happens a lot more than it should. And I totally understand why, but it's also a dumb thing. And I'll tell you why in a second. So the story that you tell yourself is, I need a new job. I am so sick of this. I am so burned out. I need a new job. Well, here's the problem with that idea. 
it's not, maybe you do need a new job, but unless you actually make some changes to your inner world, how you're behaving, how you're thinking, unless you're processing through some of the, the, and doing some of the deeper work that's necessary to initiate and sustain transformation, wherever you go, there you are. You're doing a geographic, as my friends in AA like to say, when they pick up and move to a different location, but they don't stop drinking, right? So don't do a geographic. And yet that's one of the, that's one of the go-tos. I need to find a new job or I need to go back to school. That's another version of that. I need to get another degree. I'm burned out, so I need to get another degree. Like, can we just stop with that, please? Seriously. I understand the sentiment, and certainly I have done both of those things. In one case, when I burned out, and I did say I needed to get a new job, I actually did get a new job, and it was 15 minutes from my house versus 45 minutes from my house. I didn't have to go through traffic, and that was, that was more than a geographic. That was... That was a really positive step in the direction of my mental health and well-being and helped me recover from burnout because I wasn't driving 45 minutes one way in traffic and stopping at the Krispy Kreme store for donuts and Diet Coke before work every day. So sometimes those things are true, but if you're just going with the assumption that if I get a new job, then I won't feel burned out, that's the dumb thing. So let's stop doing that. Here's another one. Number five, I should take up meditation. This is so cute. You know, I did my postdoc residency in mindfulness practices for student health at the University of Missouri. So this is meditation, mindfulness practices have been a big part of my work for years and years as I've, as I've continued to work in the corporate space. And one of the things across the board that smart people will say is I can't meditate because I can't stop thinking. And so even though you know you've read the research or you've heard the research about how good meditation is for your brain, how it can, how it can it actually change the structure and function of your brain and help you concentrate better and sleep better and do all these things, what ends up happening when you say I should meditate and you're also burned out is that you'll probably go down, download an app for meditation from the app store and you'll decide, okay, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to listen and I'm going to meditate. And five minutes in, you're like, I can't stop thinking. I'm terrible at meditation. I quit. Forget it. I'm going to go check my email. I mean, if that's you, raise your hand. And it's a very common experience among smart people who are hard workers, who are, who are really good at what they do, that they have, there's this myth around meditation that you're supposed to stop thinking. And my Buddhist friends have always said this. Asking you to stop thinking is like asking you to stop smelling or tasting or hearing or seeing. In other words, your thinking is just another sense. So in meditation, keep this in mind. If you are going to practice meditation, keep in mind two things. One, it's a practice. So the first time you do anything, you're going to be bad at it, most likely, unless you're some kind of savant. And then... Over time, as you practice, you don't have to pay attention to what your brain is thinking. Just because your brain thinks a thought doesn't A, mean it's true, or B, mean that you need to pay attention to it. Okay? So don't just quit after five minutes and then delete the app from your phone, which is the case sometimes when we get frustrated about something that we're not good at, because that's one thing that smart people have in common. If we're not good at something right away, forget about persistence and forget about staying the course with it, we just give up because things always come easily to us. And yet we know that the benefits of meditation are quite significant when it comes to burnout recovery, when it comes to feeling your best. All right. So these next two, six and seven are about asking your best friend for advice. So in, in number six, you ask your best friend for advice. You say, best friend, I am so burned out. What do you think I should do? And your best friend gives you like seriously the best advice. It's like you and me sitting down and talking about what are the things that you should do to overcome burnout. And your best friend gives you the advice and you know what you do with it? Nothing. You do nothing with it. Because you're too busy, you're too tired, you're too overwhelmed, you're too frustrated, whatever it is. 
So remember at the beginning of our time together, I said, it's not about not having the information and it's not about not knowing what to do, is it? In the second scenario, number seven, which is you ask your best friend for advice on what to do and then that your best friend comes back at you and makes it all about them. Well, I'm so burned out too and I don't know what to do either. What do you think I should do? And then you, the tables turn, right? You give your best advice on what to do. Well, you should meditate. You should take away screen time. You should get to bed earlier. You should probably stop drinking that second glass of wine, whatever it is. Do you see? You give advice that you're not even taking yourself. We're so good at giving advice, aren't we? It'd be nice if we took our own advice from time to time. All right, number eight. Here's the, here's the next one. Starting today, I'm going to drink more water. I'm going to exercise more. I'm going to get up from my desk every 50 minutes to stretch and move around. And that lasts for about three days when you're doing it on your own. It lasts for about three days before work gets in the way, before you've got to put out some more fires, before you got to get down back, back down in the weeds, whatever it is, and you just go back into that old routine. And those three days, a week from now, a month from now, you've forgotten about. Here's one. I said that there was one that was really heartbreaking, but here's one that I really take my clients to task on when they say that. What I hear a lot, especially from really talented, accomplished, quite privileged people is that they'll say, I'm burned out. I know I'm burned out, but there are lots of people in the world who have it harder than I do. And I get that. I do. I do. But here's what I say. Here's what I say to my clients. It's a little bit like when I was a little kid and I didn't want to eat my Brussels sprouts, my mom would tell me something like, well, you know, there's children starving in fill in the blank, Africa, China, wherever she decided that would be a good thing to bring to my attention and that I should be grateful that I even have Brussels sprouts and I should probably eat them because of the starving children wherever else in the world. Well, if I had been smart when I was five, I probably would have gotten in trouble for this, but I would have said, they're not going to get these Brussels sprouts either, mom. And that's kind of what... It reminds me of when I hear somebody say I'm burned out, but other people have it worse than I do. You help no one by remaining burned out. You contribute to no one by remaining burned out. And it's almost like, dare I say this? Yes, I dare. It's almost like you use other people's experiences, strife as an excuse to do nothing for your own. I know you don't do it intentionally. I doubt that you even do it consciously. So that's not such a dumb thing as it is just, it's part of being human. And it's one of those things that I wanna raise awareness about and help you be more conscious about what you're actually saying. And, you know, that's my, that's my take on that take it or leave it. You don't have to like it, but that's how I see things. That's my observation. All right. So just stop saying that you're burned out and your burnout is helping no one, including yourself and including all of the other people who have it worse than you do. The best thing that you can do for all the people who have it worse than you do, or who you believe have it worse than you do is to get yourself healthy and well so that you can be a contribution so that you can give your best. I know this is hard talk today. Velvet hammer, velvet hammer. All right. The next one, number 10, this is a really dumb approach. I've done it myself is to take the DIY approach to burnout recovery. So what that looks like is you realize you're burned out. Maybe you've watched one of my videos on burnout. Maybe you've read a blog post that I or somebody else have posted about that, or somebody has actually come up to you and said, listen, you're burned out. You need to do something about this. Whatever your next step it is, it's quite likely if you're a smart person, like I am, like the people who are with us on this, on this call today, 
the likelihood is you're going to go first to information. So you're going to find out all that you can about burnout. What are the, what are the symptoms of burnout? <clears throat> Maybe you're going to take quizzes on burnout. Maybe you're going to buy books on burnout. So you're going to learn everything that there is to know about burnout. But the truth of the matter is that you could read the entire internet on burnout and change nothing about your lived experience. It's not knowledge. It's not information. I mean, to some extent, you have to know what your symptoms are. But if that's the approach you're going to take to recovering from it, it's going to be a long recovery period. Number 11 is this one, that you apply the same mindsets, attitudes, and practices toward recovering from burnout, i.e. you use your grit, tenacity, hard work, hustle, grind, whatever those kind of energies are that got you to where you are, but also burned you out. You try to use those to recover from burnout. The world needs less of you doing when you're recover recovering from burnout and more of you receiving and being. These are two different consciousness states that especially high achievers, especially high achievers in tech and healthcare and fintech are not familiar with. It's all about the doing. It's all about the hustle and grind. And as a longtime person who's worked in tech, as a longtime person who has been on the end of recovery from burnout for many, many leaders in, in your fields, what I can tell you is that the hustle, grind, grit, tenacity, all of those old mindsets and practices have diminishing returns when it comes to your recovery from burnout. You've got to have something different than that. Remember, Einstein said that you can't solve the problem with the same consciousness that created the problem to begin with. And that's where we're at with this, with this number 11, applying the same mindsets, attitudes, and practices to recover from burnout that you use to get yourself into burnout to begin with. So let's don't do that. All right, this last one. This is the one where I said there are 11 dumb, dumb things. I'm going to amend that and say there are 10. There was the um, number nine, which was I'm burned out but a lot of people have it worse than I do. That's pretty heartbreaking. This next one, this last one is the one that if I could really eradicate this from the planet, I would. And if you're finding yourself in this position, I want you to reach out and talk to me about it before you make a decision, please. For you, for your family, for your colleagues, for the contributions that you're meant to make, please reach out to me on this one. This one is it looks like this. You get into a leadership position, Maybe you're in a director level position for the first time. Maybe you're even in a position of VP, probably not EVP at this point because you've kind of charted your path at that point, but definitely director VPs will get into a position. They get burned out. They don't feel supported. They think that there's something wrong with them. And instead of getting support or asking for support or seeking out a different solution, they're, what they decide to do is to step down from their leadership position and go back into an individual contributor position. This is heartbreaking for me, particularly when I hear women and people who are members of underrepresented groups in the corporate space. It's almost as though and I don't know that I'll exactly get this right. And it's, I think it's different for everybody, but it occurred to me that they effectively demote themselves. I'm going to step away from leadership because I don't know if I'm cut out for it because I'm burned out because I can't handle it, whatever it is. And there's so many problems with that way of thinking because we know that the systems and structures are set up to create those conditions to arise in the first place, not to put anybody in a victim position. I don't think that there are victims actually in this situation usually, but I do think that it would do you well if you're in that position of being in a leadership role and wondering, do I step out of this? Do I, and I'm using air quotes here, but do I just go back to being an individual contributor? 
because I don't want the responsibility or I can't handle the responsibility or I don't want to have to work this hard. Let's have a conversation about that before you make that decision. Maybe it is the best decision, but this is, it's certainly not a dumb approach to burnout recovery. It certainly can seem very, very necessary and as a last resort. But I think that there are always solutions that are better than effectively demoting yourself from that position. There are lots better solutions than that. And I have some of them that we're going to talk about in, in a minute. All right. So let's see what's going on over here. Okay. So remember this, as I talked about those 12 dumb things that we do or 10 dumb things and two heartbreaking things that we do as a result of being burned out, it's not about a lack of information that keeps smart people like you and me from truly recovering from burnout. It's not about lack of earnestness. What we have here is actually a fail to understand what it really takes to recover from burnout. We have a failure to understand what it really takes to recover from burnout. And that's why I'm here. So here are some of the creative ways that you can get off the gerbil wheel of burnout and start thriving again. And I wanna share some of these with you. These are some of the ways I found work for me. They've worked for my clients as well. My clients are intuitive, intelligent, top leaders from tech and healthcare. So I want you to think women engineers, women physicians, and some emotionally intelligent men too certainly find their way to me as well. I find that how you identify is less important than the emotional intelligence piece of the puzzle for the people who are working with me. But maybe you'll be able to put some of these to work in your own life as well. And as always, Consult your mental health professional to get recommendations that are specific to you and your situation. I'm not given any medical advice here. I'm just sharing some of the things that have worked for me and for many of my clients too. So are you ready? These are fun. So one of the things that you can do if burnout isn't too bad, if you're just feeling maybe more bored or frustrated or irritated with what's going on, maybe a little cynical if you've got any eye rolling going on at work, maybe you want to try this one. Change up your space. Rearrange your office. Clean off your desk. Open your windows. If you're working from home, fold your damn laundry. I just folded mine today. That was a note to self. Give yourself some new energy to work in. You really need that. I think that especially for emotionally intelligent leaders, we're so sensitive to our surroundings. There is a facet of personality that, and the personality assessment that I give that's called aesthetics. And it's the need for beauty, to need, the need to be surrounded by beauty. The need to be surrounded by beauty as a personality facet is, runs on a normal distribution curve. So most people have an average need for that. The, the people who I work with privately and myself included in this, we have a pretty strong need for beauty around us. There are some people I say who can work in a white room with no windows and be just fine. I'm not one of them. If you're here with me, if you identify as an emotionally intelligent leader, the likelihood is that you're like you're more like me than you are like the people who can work in the in the white room and wear the same thing over and over and over again. Right? We need beauty around us and when we don't have it, we get pretty badly behaved. So change your change up your workspace. Do something different with it but give yourself some new energy to work in. That oftentimes will pop me out of any kind of semi-burnout kind of crunchiness that I've been feeling. Number two, and this is one of those, I'm not giving you medical advice. This is just something that I have found works for me. And there is some research evidence to support the use of essential oils as well. I like to go with my personal experience and see how it works for me, especially when it comes recommended by somebody who I know, like, and trust. But essential oil blends are great in my experience for physical recovery from burnout. There's one blend uh, by the company doTERRA, not attached to whether or not you use it or not. There are lots of good companies out there, but it's called Motivate. And that one for me, when it comes to physical recovery from burn burnout is like a game changer. Seriously. 
I'm just remembering a time when I was burned out and I remember inhaling some of the, the motivate essential oil blend. I was at church, I think that day. And I was like, Oh my God, I feel like a million percent better right now, just because of a couple drops of this essential oil. So that might be something that you try. I also use a couple of drops of lemon essential oil in my water every morning when I get up. So first thing in the morning before my coffee, I have a couple, I have a glass of water with a couple drops of lemon essential oil also just for that just seems to have just a real clearing and detoxifying effect on my body as well. So try those out. If, if it feels aligned, do an experiment. If it feels aligned, see how you feel. The next one is this balance your electrolytes. What I found is that I was still lagging, even though I wasn't burned out, I didn't have all the energy that I wanted to have. And my clients have felt the same way. I always just tune in emotionally to see what's missing from my system. I work out a lot. I live in the desert, so there's a good chance that I'm dehydrated. So I've got to drink a lot of water anyway, but I add electrolytes to my water and I drink those all day, every day. And um, I use this sugar-free electrolyte blend that I can put a link to in the show notes if you want me to. I think that's a good idea to do. So you can check that as, out as well. But again, just... Those are a couple of, there's one, actually, before I say that, there's one more. Somebody asked me this this morning in a private message as I was preparing for this call. She said, how do I stop thinking or how do I turn my brain off after work? And um, I, I know you can probably relate to that too, right? Like you get that thinking, 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 the overthinking. Uh, one of my colleagues calls it the busy brain syndrome. It's a combination of adult ADHD and burnout that creates this constant thinking, thinking, thinking. So if that's going on for you, if you can't stop thinking when you go to bed at night or you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't stop thinking, what has worked for me is a combination of meditation plus magnesium supplement. The magnesium supplement for me, and there is some research evidence to support this as well, just really has a calming effect on my nervous system. So combination, meditation plus magnesium can be really helpful there. But I want to be frank here, because in my work with emotionally intelligent leaders, a lot of the interventions that I use are in the space of energy psychology. So a lot of it means moving and clearing emotions and the energies that are connected with having a busy brain. So I'm Gen X. I grew up watching Peanuts, the Peanuts characters. And there was one character called Pigpen and he had like a dirty cloud of dust all around him every time you'd see him. And that to me is what happens as I see it, that happens to our energy fields. We've got all of these other, we've got all of this unseen yet very palpable energy that surrounds us. Some people would call that an aura. Some people would just call it an energy field. Whatever lands for you is fine, but it goes beyond our physical, like our, our physical body. But when we get, when our, when our field, when our, our field around us gets clouded like pig pen, there's just a lot of stuff that doesn't even belong to us. So I do a lot of that energy work during my sessions with my clients. You don't have to know how it works. I just always go with the results on it and everybody feels so much better after these clearing sessions. So just know that whether you work with me or with another expert in burnout recovery, chances are quite good that you're going to run into people who are going to use tapping, EFT, emotional freedom technique, um, things like I use with energy psychology as well to support the emotional body, the mental body, and the spiritual body, because we have all of those in addition to our physical bodies. And then as a result of that, the physical body is going to feel even better, more clear, less burned out than it did before. Number six, infuse your life with something new. Everybody deserves to learn something new every single day. And if you're not learning something new every single day, chances are you're a little bit bored. Chances are you're frustrated. Chances are you're probably feeling burned out. So do something new. Learn, learn a new language. I have Duolingo on my phone and I 
practice my French. Learn a new sport, learn a new dance, learn a new instru instrument, do something new. Those novel experiences have a way of enlivening, enlivening the mind, body, and spirit. And don't just do them once, do them on the regular so that you're learning to master something new. It has nothing to do with work, does it? And everything to do with the expression of you as a human being. Number seven, reignite an old hobby that you love, whether it's scrapbooking or hiking or dancing. But do something, remember those times when you were in flow when you were younger, when you lost track of time, when you became completely absorbed in whatever that was. And please don't say that it's video games, please. Please don't. We need to do something with our physical bodies, not just with the mental body. Okay, so just find something that you used to love to do and reinitiate. Maybe it's knitting. I know that there are a lot of engineers, interestingly, who knit. It's very interesting how that how that's come about for you all. And also do scrapbook design as well. So reignite an old hobby. Number eight, if you're feeling really determined, like if you're ready, then give yourself permission and make a decision to get coaching, support, and advising on burnout recovery from an expert. Doesn't have to be me. Could be, doesn't have to be. But here's what I want you to understand about that. Doing things like watching YouTube videos or listening to podcasts or listening to LinkedIn Lives like you are now is a good start. But remember, it's not a lack of knowledge or information that keeps you from recovering from burnout and keeps you in the burnout pattern. If you're really ready to recover from burnout, then you'll find an expert who you align with, who can help you build that bridge between that burnout cycle and your version of thriving, your version of living your best life, not the perfect life, but the life that you had in your vision when you were young, the life that was more than the hustle and grind and gerbil wheel, the life of contribution and mastery, the life that I think about as actualization, actualizing your greatest, your highest potential. See, the reason it's so important to, to work with an expert on things like burnout is that your experiences deserve a witness. You deserve a witness, somebody who can understand, explain, shift perspective, affirm, and help you transcend all of the stuff that brought you to this place of burnout. You're not meant to walk the journey of recovery from burnout on your own. Most likely, you walk the journey to burnout on your own, and you see how well that went with all due respect. So often when you have a witness, what we call in psychological circles, a socially sanctioned healer, somebody who is recognized by the community as an expert, who has a deep seated understanding, knowledge and expertise in burnout recovery. It's more about processing the energetics and the emotions of burnout than it is about getting more information about how to do it. And by the way, with when you are at burnout, it's pretty likely that you've got to do some trauma processing as well. And I'm not talking necessarily that it would rise to the level of a clinical diagnosis, although sometimes it does, but even just the small, the, the little traumas, those little things that happen, the being, being silenced in a meeting or having an idea stolen from you being embarrassed, being ashamed, crying at work. All the little things add up and contribute to that overall sense of burnout, not feeling your best. So to have somebody whose sole purpose is to support you in your recovery, to see you at your best without judgment, without an agenda other than to just 
support you. That will make a huge difference in your life. So again, number eight is if you're feeling really determined, give yourself permission and make a decision to work with an expert on recovering from burnout. We're at a place in the world really, especially as I said, this month is burnout. Excuse me, I just said that. It should be, my Freudian slip is showing. It's Mental Health Awareness Month, which of course it should be Burnout Recovery Awareness Month as well. I think that that's, that's a big piece of the, the mental health puzzle at this point is burnout recovery. But um, I totally forgot where I was going with that. Just the idea here is that when you are recovering from burnout, it just is important to get that expert support that is really required in order for you to do so quickly and effectively. Not so you can get back on the gerbil wheel, but so that you can make the contributions that you came here to make and you can master the practices and ideas and, and areas that you came here to master as well. Number nine, if you do go on vacation, nothing wrong with going on vacation, I love vacations. Do so mindfully with the intention to reset your system. So maybe you choose a retreat that you go on. That's a yoga and meditation retreat. And you learn some new skills. Then when you get back from that retreat slash vacation, you'll integrate those practices into your daily life. Those practices like yoga, meditation, journaling, dancing, painting, any of those creative or mindful pursuits aren't just for someday later when you have the time. That's such an old way of thinking, isn't it? But they're meant to enrich and enliven your life every single day. And when you do those things, like yoga or meditation or painting or dancing or any of those other things that we've talked about today, when you do those things, those actually should be giving you energy, creating the conditions for you to feel your best so that when you do sit down to work, when you're at your screen, you're at your workstation, you're at your desk, you're in your office, you're leading, you're strategizing, you're doing the things that you were hired to do, you're doing those wholeheartedly. And you're bringing your very best into the workplace rather than a shell of yourself, which so many of us do, which so many of us do. All right. And the last thing I want to talk just briefly about today as we're closing out, reinvent your relationship with time and work. This is a whole can of worms that I explore in my actualization academy. I explore it in the work that I do privately with my clients as well. And I, I've started talking about this in my keynote addresses and my corporate trainings as well. When you start really looking at what is my relationship with work? What is my relationship with time? you can start to see where you might be showing up as a servant to work, an indentured servant to work. I work because I have to. Well, most of us have to work, right? There are very few people on the planet who don't have to work. We're meant to make a contribution, but if you're approaching any of your work from an indentured or a servitude perspective, if you're approaching your relationship with time as I don't have enough of it from a lack-based perspective, that shift in perspective from I don't have enough time and work is drudgery, work is blood, sweat, and tears, work is sacrifice, those, when those things shift, just shifting your perspective, how can I think of time and work differently? That's going to go a long way to supporting you as you recover from burnout. Now, maybe in a future episode, I'll, I'll break those down for you, but I just wanted to plant that seed about reinventing your relationship with time and with work. So there you have it. 12 dumb things, well, 10 dumb things and two heartbreaking things that smart people do to try to recover from burnout and 10 things that are actually worth doing and doing wholeheartedly, I hope, that you found these recommendations helpful. And I'd love to hear from you in the comments. Which ones are you going to try first? Love to hear from you. One last thing before I go. 
I mentioned this earlier, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And as always, I'm here for you and I'm here for your team. So if you're a corporate leader and you're ready to have me come in and work with you and your team on simple but effective psychological strategies and practices that make burnout recovery easier and the back to the office anxiety, not even a thing that you have to deal with, you can email my team. Email Brandy, B-R-A-N-D-I at drrobinmckay.com. And we can set up a time to have a conversation about creating a bespoke program for you and your team. Remember, when I work with teams, I keep things pretty high level. We stay in the positive psychology realm. It's not until people move into my private coaching in my inner circles that we really start working on the energetics of leadership and the energetics of burnout recovery. So I want you to keep that in mind as well, because not everybody is ready for these deeper levels of transformation that my company provides certain people. So we're booking corporate trainings for the end of Q2 and on into the second half of the year. So you can do that. And last thing, if you are an emotionally intelligent leader and you're ready, you've decided you're ready to get support on burnout recovery, I'm here for you too. So you can apply to work with me privately and we'll drop the application link in the show notes so that you can have that. And keep in mind, burnout recovery takes between six and nine months when you're working with an expert. It can take much longer if you're taking the do-it-yourself approach, but there's no quick fix. You didn't get here overnight, and you're certainly not going to recover overnight either, but you'll get there a whole lot faster when you go with somebody who knows how to do it right. So that's all I have for you today. I hope that you found this helpful. I hope this served you in some way. I am Dr. Robin McKay, and I will see you next time on Mindset Rx.